I just want to introduce our next speakers. It brings me great pleasure to introduce Ed Wild, Drs. Ed Wild and Dr. Jeff Carroll. Um, Ed and Jeff are no strangers to most of you in the research in the HD community. They're regular speakers at HD-related conferences around the world, and, and probably most known as being the co-founders of HDBuzz.net, which reports on HD research in plain language that's written by scientists for the benefit of the global HD community. So if you haven't checked out the site, I don't know what you're waiting on, do it. Um, um, it's an incredible resource for the community. Jeff is currently an assistant professor at Western Washington uh, University in the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Neuroscience. Jeff was a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Marcy McDonald's lab uh, in Harvard Medical School. And before that, he received his Bachelor's of Science in Biology and his PhD in Neuroscience at the University of British Columbia under the direction of Dr. Michael Hayden, as you've already heard. Um, before Jeff uh, joined the fight against HD, he spent nearly five years in the U.S. Army fighting to protect our country in the, uh, in the U.S. Army. Jeff's most recent HD research has involved the investigation of metabolic changes in HD and the use of antisense oligonucleotides to silence the mutant Huntington gene in animal models of HD. So Jeff's partner in crime is Dr. Ed Wild, and he comes to us from across the pond, where he is uh, currently the NIHR clinical lecturer in neurology at the University College of London's Institute of Neurology. Wow, that's a lot of words. Um, Ed received his medical degree from uh, Christ College at Cambridge University, his PhD in neuroscience from uh, the University College of London under the director of uh, Sarah Tabrizi. Ed currently serves on the medical, journal, medical advisory board for the United Kingdom HD Association and is on the scientific and bioethical advisory committee of the European HD Network. And uh, it's also interesting to note that both Jed and Ed and Jeff are on the editorial board of Yes, we have our own Journal of Huntington's Disease now to kind of to account for all of those papers that are now being published. So as I mentioned earlier, Ed and Jeff founded HD Buzz in 2010 to provide an impartial and easily understood information on research activities. Um, uh, their work with HD Buzz has been featured at research meetings around the world, at the annual CHDI Therapeutics Conference, the Society for Neuroscience last year, and uh, as most recently as the 2013 GET Conference. So please join me in welcoming Drs. Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll as they come to the stage to present their talk entitled, The Drugs Are Coming. Thank you, George. That sounded ominous. Good morning. How are we doing? Cool. So. The drugs are coming, is the title of our talk. Let me just try and get this uh, clicker working. Mm. We have clicker issues. That's OK. There we go. So uh, we have no relevant financial disclosures to list. And if you feel unwell, you should see a doctor. <laughs> we want to tell you 10 exciting things today. We want to tell you five big things that give us reasons to have real hope that uh, treatments for Huntington's disease that make a real difference can be achieved. And then we want to give you another five things, which are very specific things to look out for, listen out for, and uh, watch out for when it comes to specific treatments that are being worked on for Huntington's disease. This is what uh, I think of when I think of coming up with effective treatments for Huntington's disease. This mountain, we're all on this journey together to the top of the challenging mountain of coming up with treatments for Huntington's disease. And when I say we're in it together, I really mean it. Scientists, researchers, doctors, physio physiotherapists, patients and family members, all in the same boat, all on the same journey. You shouldn't try and get to the top of a mountain in a boat. That was a bad analogy. <laughs> The thing about this particular mountain is that the top of it is veiled in cloud because we don't know how high it is. We know it's high, and we believe we can get there, but we don't know exactly how high it is. And in my view and in our view, um, it would be foolish to wake up in the morning and look at a mountain like that and say, I want to get to the top of that mountain. I'll be there by sunset. 
A journey like that needs to be broken down into a series of smaller steps. You need to keep the top of the mountain in mind, but you need to break the journey down into a series of manageable steps. And that way, you know when you've gone forward one step. If you go back one step, you haven't lost a great deal, and there's always other steps that you can take. So breaking down a big journey into little steps is what we're here to do today. It's also what we do through HD Buzz, which uh, George has already mentioned, so I'll be very brief in, in reiterating that it is a scientist-driven research news platform for Huntington's disease families. We take papers that uh, a lot of scientists struggle to understand, and we translate them into plain language um, so that family members around the world can uh, find out what's going on. And you can all hear about these little chunks of hope. So keep the big journey in mind, but we will also supply you with the little steps along the way. Um, this is Sarah, who is manning our HD Buzz stand. Not I think we have really. four HD Buzz baseball caps left. If you sign up to follow us by email or Twitter or Facebook, you, you will, uh, and if you're really quick after this session, you'll get one of the four remaining baseball caps. Even if there are no hats left, you should sign up and follow us by email anyway. Uh, so I think this has already been uh, well covered. Everybody knows how to use Google, but this is where we're at. Uh, we're at hdbuzz.net. Uh, you can find our content also on the HDSA website, uh, as well as all your favorite social media. Um, so uh, come find us, basically. We're there for you. Uh, I wanted to start uh, in, in part. Is that echo because this microphone is on? Oh, OK. I'm just not very clever, so a little bit of feedback just throws me off. Uh, we wanted to thank in particular the HDSA, you, uh, and Louise Vetter in particular personally, because when HD Buzz was just an idea uh, and we went looking for money for it, we thought, well, this is a good idea. Everybody's going to say educating patients is great. Here's some money. Uh, it turns out, no. Uh, in fact, it's actually quite hard to find someone motivated to educate patients. And the HDSA, and, and Louise in particular, uh, took a chance on us and uh, helped support us in the early days when it was just an idea. So thanks to the HDSA and to Louise. Okay, so we're going to kick off our lightning research tour with five big reasons to have hope. And the first one is a slightly controversial one because it contains the C word, curable or cure. Um, if you read any scientific paper you'll, you, about Huntington's or any newspaper story, you'll read that Huntington's is incurable, which it is, but so is HIV, as Dr. Hayden has mentioned, so is diabetes, so is the common cold. But people with a cold are not described as having an incurable nose disorder. What do I, what do I mean when I say that Huntington's is, an inc is the most curable, incurable brain disorder? Well, it comes down to the discovery in 1993, 20 years and three months ago, of the single genetic mutation that causes Huntington's. Everyone with that mutation will get Huntington's. Everyone with HD has the same basic mutation. Uh, that's a stark fact for people facing that risk. But actually, when you put that in the context of other diseases, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or motor neuron disease, that gene gives us a massive advantage that none of those other diseases have. We know what causes our disease, and that is not true of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or motor neuron. We know what causes HD, and therefore we know exactly what we have to do in order to cure it and to come up with effective treatments. We have to stop that mutation from causing damage to our brains and bodies. And 20 years of some of the smartest scientists in the world working day and night to figure out what that mutation is doing in our bodies has produced huge amounts of knowledge and understanding of the things that go wrong. And each thing that goes wrong is a potential drug target, a potential treatment target for HD. So that's what I mean when I say it's the most curable, incurable brain disorder. Thanks to the gene and the research that followed its discovery, we have a huge head start. Another reason that uh, we're optimistic uh, is what we really think is the unique nature of the Huntington disease community. I, I'm really inspired by how many people are here. I think it's amazing. Um, and so the traditional groups like the HDSA have grown and become so strong uh, from the efforts of all of, of you, uh, but also new uh, grassroots efforts that we see that are really exciting. So HDO is here. Where Matt, where are you guys at? All the young people, oh, they're probably at their booth. All the young people, make sure and uh, go sign up. Uh, they have great information for young people, and I think keeping young people integrated into this cause is a way to, to grow this community. 
Um, groups like the Huntington Study Group and the European Huntington Disease Network are helping run clinical trials. They know what they're doing now. It's not a guess about how to run a clinical trial in Huntington disease. There's a lot of study. And finally, CHDI. So uh, can you raise your hand if you've heard of CHDI? Uh, okay, raise your hand if you haven't. So um, uh, everybody's introduced me. I feel silly talking about myself, uh, starting with my science dad. But um, uh, I'm also a Huntington's disease mutation carrier and family member. And, and I want to tell you what CHDI means to me. So this organization is spending, as George said, something like $100 million a year only on Huntington's disease. So if you're somebody who carries a mutation for a rare disease and you wake up and suddenly, thanks to the generosity of some donors, somebody wants to spend $100 million a year on your disease, that's like, that's like a movie plot. It's incredible. We're all so lucky, those of us who don't have $100 million a year to spend, that someone is. So at the, for these reasons, we think this, uh, the growth of the global HD community is a reason for real optimism. So um, not to uh, talk badly about my own people, uh, but uh, getting scientists to work together and do stuff is something like herding cats. Uh, <laughs> scientists by nature and by personality are almost inevitably argumentative, uh, contrary, and they have quite sharp claws. Uh, and so one of the things that CHDI has done besides the money uh, is, is to s try and get the global uh, community of HD scientists, uh, maybe even more so than before, to, to work together towards a coherent goal. It's a really distracting video to have behind you. Uh, Cute though, right? So thanks CHDI for hurting cats is the message. Something for everyone. Cowboys and cats. So the third big, big idea of R5 is what I call the golden window of opportunity. And again, this is something that is almost unique to HD because of the gene mutation that we know about. But what it, what it is is that if you, you think about the life of someone who carries the HD mutation, for a while they'll be okay, and then at some point they will get signs of Huntington's disease, and those will gradually increase. And we call that symptom onset. What we know from studying animal models and humans with HD or with the mutation is that for a long time before symptom onset, there are neurons, there are brain cells that are unhappy or are unwell, but they're not dying yet. So later on, brain cells dying more than they should is a big problem. But throughout the course of the disease, there's this problem with neurons struggling to stay healthy. They're, they're under pressure and they're unhappy, but they're not dead. And what we know from studying the disease in animals is that if you can relieve some of that pressure, just make things a little bit easier, then those brain cells should be able to fix themselves partially or completely. The advantage that HD comes from and this idea of the golden window of opportunity comes from the genetic test. You can have the genetic test um, to predict onset from the age of 18 onwards, and then what that gives us is potentially decades during which, first of all, we can study the earliest effects of Huntington's disease and figure out what's going on in the human brain and body that's caused by the mutation. But also, this is a potential several decade treatment window where if we can produce a drug that makes just a small bit of difference, we should be able to make a big difference year on year in pushing forward this symptom onset. So we make the neurons a little bit healthier and the symptom onset is pushed forwards. And if we can do that a little bit, maybe with several different drugs, as Dr. Hayden said, that's how you ultimately you end up curing a disease. You push the symptom onset forward to beyond the stage where people die of old age. And it comes down to making these little steps of progress, making a little difference that, because of the genetic test and mutation, may be sustained over several years and make a huge difference. Another reason um, that we are optimistic is the idea that maybe having symptoms doesn't mean it's too late. Often we talk to patients and family members that are concerned that because their family member already has symptoms, what if there's a drug, will it help them? And of course, we don't know. I mean, that's, we'd love to solve that problem and have drugs that we can answer that question with. But we have scientific, good scientific reasons for believing uh, that there is still reasons for hope. Uh, there have been several experiments, both genetic and with drugs, that have taken a mouse uh, that was born, uh, induced by scientists to have a mutant HD gene, just like people, uh, and is born healthy, and just like a person with an HD gene that's mutated, the mouse gets sick. So if you turn off that gene that makes them sick, uh, initially people thought, well, maybe the mice will sort of level out. Maybe they'll stop getting more sick. But in fact, in, in both cases, with the drug and with uh, genetic uh, tricks, uh, the mice got better. So once the insult stopped, once, once the, uh, the, the damage was stopped being caused, 
uh, the brain was able in some way uh, to improve. And so we're, are, we're hopeful that if therapies are developed that are successful, uh, maybe they can uh, provide benefit to people who already have damage. And the fifth big reason is a slightly soppy one that uh, is of my own uh, making. Uh, it's this idea that science is cumulative. Um, I think personally that science is like a glacier, um, which is formed when snowflakes fall on top of a mountain. And to me, each individual piece of scientific research or each idea that a scientist or a family member has about how we might be able to help with HD is like a snowflake. And no single snowflake will make a huge difference. But if enough snowflakes fall, we end up with this huge structure which develops over many years and can literally carve mountains. And that is what science is to me. Every day we know a bit more than we did yesterday. Tomorrow we know a bit, we'll know a bit more. And the day when we can treat Huntington's disease is one day closer every day. Here comes the science part. So we want to start with a little perspective. And this will be familiar to anyone who was in our science session yesterday. This is uh, where we live. This is the Milky Way galaxy. I think we're around about here. Um, it contains 100,000 million stars. And if you multiply that number by 100, you get the number of cells in the human body. Give or take a few. A cell looks something like this. It has the cell membrane which surrounds it. In the middle, or somewhere in the cell, is this control center called the nucleus. And the goo around the nucleus is called the cytoplasm. Now, cells do stuff. Neurons do our thinking. Uh, skin cells prevent us from exploding. And the way that cells, uh, I, hope some, I hope everyone wrote that down, skin cells prevent us from exploding. That's a very important take home message. Um, all of the stuff that cells do, the, the thing that makes cells into useful things is these proteins. These are molecular machines. And our body's capable of making around about 20,000 different proteins, each with a different function. And together, the, the balance of proteins in each cell determines what the cell does. In our nucleus is the recipe book for making these proteins. Our DNA is divided into genes, and one gene is a recipe for one protein. Now, if you have a very precious recipe book, you're not going to want it out in the kitchen where it's going to get splashed and damaged. So our cells have a very clever way of protecting the, the uh, recipe book. Basically, when the cell wants to make a protein, first it makes a working copy of the recipe. And it makes that from this molecule that's like DNA. It's called RNA, the message molecule. It's a bit like, a, um, like an index card with a handwritten recipe on it. So this index card is then read several times by the cell's protein-making machinery. This string of building blocks, like beads called amino acids, is then put together. It scrunches up, and you get the protein, which is the, stuff, the thing that's going to do the cool stuff in your cells. Now, in the case of Huntington's disease, the gene that causes Huntington's disease is called the Huntington gene. Genes and proteins generally end in I-N. So George Huntington gave his name to the Huntington gene. When that's switched on, you get Huntington RNA. The amino acids are put together, and the end result is the Huntington protein. And everybody makes that protein in almost every cell of their body. Now, this is where the CAG idea comes into it. It turns out that when the DNA is being read, three letters or chemical uh, codes in that DNA corresponds to one amino acid building block. So, for instance, TCC in your DNA results in the building block, which we call serine, letter S, being added to the growing protein. CAG causes a building block called glutamine to be added to the growing protein. And that's why you may have heard Huntington's disease called a polyglutamine disease, because in a person with VHD mutation who will get Huntington's disease, there are too many of these CAGs at the beginning of the Huntington gene. And the number of CAGs you have in the gene corresponds to the number of glutamines you will end up with in your Huntington protein. So it's a small difference in the gene, but it makes a big difference to the protein. So the normal protein looks something like this, like a squiggle. 
but it's got this red, this stretch of glutamines at the beginning. In the mutant protein, the glutamine stretch is longer and the rest of the protein changes shape as a result. And if you're a protein, change in shape causes change in function. Proteins do everything they do by being a very exact shape so that they can interact with other proteins. That change in shape causes the formation of this, public enemy number one, the mutant or altered Huntington protein. It looks kind of like a mountain. Um, this is a, a, an incredibly high power microscope picture of the mutant Huntington protein. And one of the things it does, and it was one of the first things that was spotted in HD mice, is that it, it becomes sticky. It forms these long kind of snake-like structures and they then join together and form these blobs or uh, mountains or clumps of protein which we call aggregates. And that's one of several things that changes in the, in the mutant protein. It develops a number of new properties that make it toxic and poisonous. Uh, to me, this is a spanner in the works, but I don't think that makes any sense in this room. So I guess this is a wrench in the machinery, right? <laughs> but this is what the mutant Huntington protein does in your cells. It messes up all of the smooth running processes that enable your cells to stay healthy. But remember, each one of those things that the protein messes up is a potential treatment target for Huntington's disease. Which brings us on to the five things that we think are coolest in terms of specific treatments that are being worked on. And we're going to start with something that's been mentioned already because all scientists think it's cool. Uh, we should say before we start, there are a lot of things, as scientists say, in the pipeline. There's a lot of drugs being developed. To a certain extent, these are somewhat arbitrary. We, either one of us could have picked another five. Um, because there's just so much exciting stuff happening. But we want to briefly cover the idea of reducing the Huntington uh, gene. So gene silencing, people might have heard about. Uh, improving communication. Or, so let's come back to our, um, our, this is the central dogma of molecular biology. You're all molecular biologists now. Congratulations. <laughs> if you can remember gene RNA protein, that's all you need to know. So uh, the idea, as somebody uh, noticed in our talk yesterday, was, well, there's a weak link in this chain. We've got this mutant Huntington gene. We probably can't get rid of that, but see you later. Uh, but what about this index card? This is kind of the weak link in the chain. If we could stop the message, could we get rid of the Huntington protein? So the, the lady in our audience who had that idea had it about 10 years too late because somebody just got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, but, but in fact, you can. And there's, there's multiple chemical ways of attacking that message basically putting little chemicals in the cell that will go find not all of the messages, but a specific message and delete it, get rid of it. You might have heard of things called antisense oligonucleotides or RNA interference. They're just different chemical means of achieving the same goal, which is to get rid of that message. And suffice it to say they work. They block the message and stop the Huntington protein from getting made. There's an enormous amount of work going on in this. We, as we all know, every single person with Huntington's disease has a mutation in the same gene. If we can get rid of that mutant gene, we all hope that we can affect uh, the course of disease. There have been many successful trials in mice with a whole bunch of chemical derivatives. Every time it's been tried in mice, it works. If you give it to mice that have a mutant HD gene and they get sick, if you give them drugs that silence the mutant Huntington, they seem to get better. It's important before you go to the FDA or the other regulatory agencies that you haven't just put your uh, chemical in mice, that you've done it on something more like a person. And so these primate studies, testing a drug in monkeys uh, to see if it's toxic are really important, but they're also expensive, so they don't get done unless something good is happening. There have been multiple primate studies with these gene silencing approaches. There was just a trial in ALS, a safety trial with one of these approaches, antisense oligonucleotides, which was safe. Um, and there's, there's at least three different groups that we know of that are uh, aggressively pursuing uh, the FDA to do gene silencing in humans. Uh, and we think trials uh, in HD patients are likely to start very soon. Uh, there's a ton of stuff on HD Buzz about gene silencing. It's been a very popular topic, so just search uh, gene silencing on HD Buzz if you want to hear more. Uh, one, one thing just to point out, this isn't so much science, but, but sort of the politics of science, which is that uh, Isis Pharmaceuticals, which is the company, uh, a company that makes antisense, recently announced a deal with Roche, a major pharmaceutical company. So Roche paid Isis $32 million up front. Uh, to help them develop gene silencing approaches for Huntington's disease. If these things go all the way to the clinic and end up being treatments for all of us, the, the ISIS stands to make as much as $360 million from Roche. So uh, the point of this is that 
uh, big pharmaceutical companies are placing large financial bets on the idea that you can silence the Huntington, mutant Huntington gene and have a, a beneficial effect for Huntington's patients. They're betting with their significant amount of dollars. So we think this is super exciting just because it shows how advanced the science is. <laughs> this is exactly how excited you should be. Uh, read about it on HDBuzz. Oh, delivery, sorry. Uh, people ask us about these silencing things. The downside of these silencing, it sounds perfect, right? Just get rid of the mutant gene. The problem is the chemistry of these things is hard to get into the brain, so it doesn't, for now, look like it'll be a kind of a pill delivery. Uh, several approaches, including the ISIS one, involve uh, delivering the um, drug to the fluid in the uh, central nervous system through a needle and a pump, which is unfortunate, but, I mean, if it helped HD, we'd all sign up, I think. Uh, other approaches, particularly the ones that use so-called RNA interference, rely on using viruses, uh, empty viruses, to deliver uh, messages uh, to, to do silencing to the brain. And those pumps are being developed by a company called Medtronic, who makes them for a lot of medical indications, and they'll deliver uh, silencing right to brain tissue. Oh, uh, something that seemed completely science fiction even just a few years ago is the idea that we could actually edit people's DNA and not fix the message, but fix their actual mutation. And I never would have believed that was possible. There's now a new approach, something called zinc fingers, you can read about it in HD Buzz, that might someday in the future let us actually edit out the mutation from people's DNA, but that's certainly farther away than these other approaches. It doesn't actually look like that. <laughs> it's artist rendition. In case you were wondering. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about involves these things called synapses, which are the gaps between neurons. You probably know that the brain is special because it does electrical stuff, okay? So neurons are, are like electrical cables that send messages using electricity down the length of them. But whenever a neuron wants to talk to another neuron, there's a gap between them, and the electricity cannot get across that gap. Instead, the message gets across chemically. So the electricity triggers chemical molecule uh, neurotransmitters to enter the second neuron that wants to be involved in this conversation. So when that happens, it's something like this. The molecule enters the cell, and then this chemical cascade happens, a series of chemical reactions that generates a ton of signaling molecules. When that's all over, it all needs to be recycled so that it, it, the event can happen again next time the neuron needs to be woken up. And it's done by this Pac-Man enzyme called PDE, which stands for phosphodiesterase. You knew that was going to happen, right? Mm. Now, it turns out that in Huntington's disease, those enzymes are overactive. The signaling molecules inside the neuron are being uh, vacuumed up too rapidly. And so these PDE enzymes are a really promising target that's being worked on by a number of people. The idea is that by reducing the activity of those enzymes with these PDE inhibitors, and PDE10 turns out to be the most promising, um, you should be able to improve the signaling between neurons. Pfizer, drug giant Pfizer, uh, who some of you, don't put your hands up, may know of because of they uh, were the guys who invented Viagra, which is a PDE inhibitor. They are um, big into PDE inhibition, and they have a program in Huntington's disease to investigate PDE activity and rapidly press forward their candidate drug to clinical trials. The drug improves symptoms and cellular damage when it's tested in mice. They just completed, like a couple of months ago, the human trial using chemical imaging in the brain to decide whether HD mutation carriers' brains do indeed have the right sorts of chemical derangements. They found that they do, and they're now pressing on with their clinical trial. That's planned, and we have a, um, a buzz article that you can check out if you want to find out more about PDE inhibitors. I should just uh, jump in here and say that there was also some buzz about a uh, press release from a company called Omeros in Seattle that also just announced they're doing a PDE-10 inhi inhibition. So two things. One, it's good when more than one company thinks this is worth putting some money into. And two, while I want everyone to make money uh, selling HD drugs, a little competition pushing people along never hurt anything. So that's good news, I think. Uh, so here we're going to talk about growth factors. We have to talk a little bit about anatomy. So here's our, a human brain. Uh, the outside wrinkly bit, the cortex, does all of our interesting thinking, we think. Uh, the part of the brain that we're particularly interested in Huntington's disease is deep down inside the brain. So you might have heard words like basal ganglia, striatum, caudate. Uh, these are all parts of the same uh, sets of cells down deep underneath the brain. 
Uh, and it turns out that neurons, when they talk to each other, they don't just send electrical messages. They send a uh, little sort of uh, nourishment, a little message that says, hey, buddy, stay alive, basically. Uh, neurons have to receive these messages in order to stay alive because it keeps neurons that have happy communication uh, uh, active in the brain. Uh, and so these, these trophic factors, as scientists call them, this sort of feeding from one cell to another between the cortex and the striatum, one's called BDNF. And it turns out that there's not enough BDNF and HD, and maybe that's one of the reasons this deep part of the brain is dying. So BDNF normally uh, latches on uh, to a, a sort of a lock, so it's like a key and a lock, and the, and the um, lock is something called a receptor, which is what receives the signal. The receptor happens to be called track in this case, and so there's an obvious idea in HD of either giving more BDNF which is one idea to keep the, the deep parts of the brain healthy. Or alternatively, in a strategy being pursued by CHDI, maybe we could use just a little tiny molecule instead of using the whole normal big protein that does this. Maybe we can find a way to trick the cells into thinking there's lots of BDNF around and keep them healthy for longer. And that's an active uh, drug program. So we've heard a little bit about inflammation already. And I'm going to talk a bit more about this. This is a, a, a field that, that my research has touched on. Um, it's also something that Dr. Hayden's mentioned when it comes to Teva's drug, Laquinimod. I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle and talk about microglia, uh, which, uh, as we've heard, are the immune cells. So the orange stuff that you can probably just about see in the background here is the neurons. The microglia here are the green uh, cells on top. And those are the brain's immune cells. They protect the brain against infection. And when brain cells die, which is happening in all of us all the time, um, the microglia mop up the uh, trash that's floating around. So I need to tell you about two characters called Quinn and Kina. And this is a classic tale of good versus evil. Microglia produce a molecule called quinolinic acid, also known as Quinn, and kynurenic acid, also known as Kina. And hopefully from the slide, you can figure out what way this is heading, OK? So quinolinic acid is harmful to neurons. Kynurenic acid protects neurons. And in, in, that includes protecting them against quin. In the normal situation, kina wins. So there's more kina than quin. In HD, the situation is reversed. There's too much quin. Too much of the damaging stuff is being produced by microglia. And the enzyme, which basically determines the balance between quin and kina, is called KMO. So there's a lot of work going on to see, can we develop drugs to deactivate KMO and restore the healthy balance of quin and kina? Now, um, several teams are working on these approaches. And a couple of years ago, uh, one team announced that they had extended the life of an HD mouse by giving a drug uh, that modulates KMO activity. One fascinating thing about that drug was that it didn't actually get into the brain. The drug acted peripherally in the blood, and then something changed about the blood that made the brain healthier. So it's pretty cool, because it means that this idea that you have to get the drug into the brain in order to help the brain may not be quite as rigid as we'd previously thought it. And more recently, in the past couple of months, we heard an update from CHDI about their KMO inhibitor program. Their drug is called CHDI246. Not only does it do cool things that, are, that look helpful um, when you, uh, when you uh, treat uh, slices of mouse brain in a Petri dish, but um, if you give this drug to primates and then look at the spinal fluid, you see the sorts of changes that you would like to see when you give this drug to patients. So the drug appears to be doing the sorts of things that we want it to do in order to be helpful to human patients. And so CHDI is now working very hard towards human trials of these KMO inhibitor drugs. And uh, for more on this, check out HD Buzz. I got all the hard molecular biology ones. It's really not fair. All right, so the last one we're going to talk about is something about called transcriptional regulation. So your skin cells keeping you from exploding and your neurons talking to one another to do computation have the same set of genes. Everybody, all the cells in your body have the same set of genes in their DNA. So it's a bit of a mystery. How does one cell end up a skin cell and one cell end up a brain cell? It turns out it does it by regulating which genes are turned on and turned off uh, in any given cell. It's a very complex process. Um, we know uh, from a lot of data over a lot of years that having a mutant Huntington protein around seems to mess up this switching on and off the right gene. So in a given cell, maybe there's some skin cells in a neuron cell and vice versa. Um, 
one of the ways that genes are switched off is by locking them up. And they're locked up on proteins called histones. Um, we, uh, there's more on HD buzz for people who are really interested in the, the geekery of this. Um, but there are enzymes called HDACs, scientists call them HDACs, that help regulate this, whether a gene is, is locked or, or open. Uh, and it seems uh, that if we could inhibit these enzymes, we could maybe fix the damage the mutant Huntington protein is doing and making skin cells look only like skin cells and make neurons act only like neurons. There's a whole bunch of these HDACs, biology is complicated, uh, and a scientist in, in uh, London, uh, Jill Bates, has gone through and made mice that lack each of them. And then uh, uh, cross those mice, bred those mice to HD mice, and seen which of them gets better. And this one particular called HDAC4 seems to make HD mice an awful lot better. So that's very exciting. So CHDI uh, did what they showed up on the scene to do, which is to make a drug to actually uh, do this in a way that we could do in people. Uh, and the drug seems to do what they, the chemist developed it to do, but it doesn't seem to make the mice that much better. It has effects on the mice, but it doesn't make their HD symptoms better. So this is obviously confusing, and why is this a top five? It's a top five because this is how science works. You make a hypothesis, you get a weird result, you go back and you make a new hypothesis, and there's uh, active science still happening on here, and there's still mice out there that are a lot better that lack HDAC4. There's something about that enzyme that's good, we're just not quite there yet. Um, but this is say, an earlier stage uh, program that's really exciting. This, Ed snapped this picture when we were at the, H the annual HD Therapeutics Conference that CHDI puts on every year a few months ago. This is a, we, neither one of us understands this at all. Uh, <laughs> This is a hardcore sort of chemistry slide. How do we make a drug that fits in this exact pocket on this exact enzyme? And we took it because it was so baffling, because it's so wonderful that they've hired experts that are good at making molecules that fit into the, uh, where they need to be to actually make drugs. Uh, so this, this kind of stuff wouldn't have happened, uh, we think, uh, very long ago in the HD world. This is, this is all new, exciting science. So I think that the take home message is that this drug discovery pipeline from identifying targets through to animal models and human trials is full. These are just three of dozens of other things that are being worked on, and they're all being worked on all the time, and new ideas come up every day as well. So how can we make it go faster? George already mentioned the valley of death, this gap between cell and animal models and human trials. And here's how I see it. We've got the mice on the left, representing animal models, and on the right, Irish teen pop sensations, Jedward. I, I told him this wouldn't work. Can you raise your hand if you've heard of Jedward? Nobody knows. We, we okay, you all need to go else. away and Google Jedward, because to, to my mind, they represent all of humanity. <laughs> So this is where we are now. This is the little tiny gap that we have to get through, the drugs have to get through, in order to move from mice to humans. And partly that's because the models aren't as good as we would like them to be, but also partly it's because we don't understand human HD well enough. So one thing we can do to make the gap bigger is to improve our understanding of HD, and that's the job of scientists. You know, keep them funded, they'll keep doing that. We will never understand enough about human HD, which is the other way of increasing this gap and getting the drugs across this valley of death without more trials and more studies involving humans. So the drugs are coming, but if you want to make them happen more quickly, HD research needs you. Studies like Track HD and Predict HD have told us a huge amount about the biology of HD and also how we can run these clinical trials to get drugs that have been designed for HD into patients and tested out more efficiently. And I want to give a, a big mention to the new H HDSA Human Biology Project, which is specifically aimed at addressing this issue, studying patients to enhance our understanding and to get the drugs uh, licensed. There's this, I just want to mention briefly the idea that we need to slow down the biology of HD. That's what we've been talking about, these designer drugs that will slow down the progression of HD by preventing damage in cells. But I also want you to reflect on the idea that keeping people well one day at a time is, is the same thing and is what we need to achieve whether that's through slowing down the damage that the gene causes or whether it's through managing symptoms. So one more day where you're well enough to go to work or you're well enough to love your family or uh, you know, go, out and go out for a walk and spend time with your kids, that's a win however it's accomplished. 
Think of Parkinson's disease, okay? Parkinson's is the same as HD in that there are no treatments that slow down the damage to brain cells. But a drug called levodopa, which simply relieves stiffness and helps movements in Parkinson's disease. We now know that giving people that drug extends their lifespan by five years, even though it doesn't affect the biology of the disease. It doesn't affect the damage to brain cells. And it does it by keeping people active and keeping people well and uh, enabling them to enjoy a little bit more of their early uh, disease life, where they have symptoms, but they're able to stay well. So I do want to emphasize that slowing the damage is important, and it's what scientists are working on, but we also need to improve symptom management, improve quality of care, standards of care, get more money for treatments to uh, help symptoms, more physical physical therapy, more occupational therapy, art therapy, and disseminate that best practice. And doing both of these is what the HDSA's Human Biology Project will achieve, and I think that that's an amazing thing. I want to mention briefly this study, because this is going to be the biggest study of HD that has ever happened. It's, it's enrolling now already in the USA. It's going to be a global study. Um, it follows on uh, from several big studies that are already happening. You can sign up for Enroll HD uh, whether you're a gene carrier, whether you're at risk but haven't been tested, or you can sign up as a control subject. And it will basically help us understand the biology of HD. And when it comes to running trials of the drugs we've been talking about, Enroll HD will be critical because it's from the Enroll HD database that we will effectively recruit those trials as quickly as possible so we can get the answers that we need. I want to finish with a single quotation from the Guardian newspaper in the UK in 2010 from someone called Rebecca Potter, who's an HD patient. And she wrote something that Jeff and I wholeheartedly agree with that um, hopefully will inspire you guys to keep up the good work and to keep uh, tuned to the research world. There's never a good time to have HD, but this is the best time so far in history. We agree, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you guys, that was fantastic. Um, I know we're running a little late, but we want to make sure that if there's some questions that we address them. Does anyone have any questions for Ed and Jeff in the back? Right here? There and then somewhere in the sun over there. The sun. Um, this is kind of hard to put into a question, but I know a lot of people that may be interested in participating in a clinical trial who are still quote unquote normal, but have been tested, how, how much are they protected privacy wise? So that, you know, because you have to be concerned about discrimination with insurances, employment, et cetera. So with the trials that uh, we mentioned specifically in Roll HD, there's been an enormous amount of effort put into the, the, the privacy of people's data. And I think, I think there's a fair bit of this on their website, I think, right? Can I get a nod from somebody? So I think you should check that out. Enroll in particular has a lot of information. Uh, you, I think it's worth mentioning that you can uh, specifically request that your general practitioner or family health physician not be notified. So it's routine for your your health, your family doctor to be informed if you're taking part in a clinical trial, but you can also request that they not be informed that your participation can remain completely uh, isolated. And all trial procedures in every clinical trial are completely uh, protected by extremely rigorous data protection regulations throughout the world. In your, in your talk, you mentioned a phrase, gene positive, until that time that symptoms occur. I've been asked by several of my online support friends to ask, when does Huntington's occur? Does it occur when the physical symptoms manifest? Does it occur when the cognitive symptoms start showing up? Does it begin when the behavioral symptoms show up? We've known for quite a long time, and I think PredictHD shows us that the cognitive symptoms 
show up way long before the physical symptoms show up. Why are we not diagnosing patients with Huntington's when the cognitive symptoms show up? Wow, that's a great question. When does Huntington's disease begin? Um, it's one of the biggest questions that we face as a community, a research community, a patient family community, and a clinical community. The official answer right now is that Huntington's disease is officially diagnosed when an experienced physician or clinician diagnoses the emergence of motor abnormalities or neurological signs, physical signs, that are unequivocally due to Huntington's disease in someone with the HD mutation. So physical neurology uh, signs like chorea are the official clinical diagnosis now. But as you say, over the past 20 years, we've learned a huge amount, not just from clinical trials like PREDICT and track HD, which have told us what is changing in the brains and bodies of mutation carriers before they're officially diagnosed, but also just from talking to you guys, because we hear all the time, you know, I knew I was going to get diagnosed. I could see it coming for 10 years. My mood wasn't right. I couldn't concentrate. Um, you know, uh, I was depressed. Uh, I was irritable. So these are all things uh, that, that are extremely common and frequently do precede onset. I personally think that it would be useful for us to revisit the official criteria for how HD is diagnosed, and I think that we are probably working towards that. It has to be said that for clinical purposes, it's hard to do, because depression and anxiety and irritability are common in the general population, whereas chorea isn't. And they're also um, things that can be triggered by growing up in a stressful environment. So, for instance, surrounded by family members who are, who are ill. That can make people depressed. So having the mutation and being depressed, you can see why that makes it difficult to officially diagnose HD, even if the suspicion is there. And, but I think that studies like track and predict will enable us to give people a much more accurate idea of what's going on. And I think in the future, we will probably see disease onset uh, redefined. But it needs to happen with everybody's consent. It's not something that doctors should be handing down. It's something that, that needs to be jointly agreed by patients and families and the clinical research community. And a process of consultation has already begun um, among experts and family members led by CHDI but not controlled by them um, in order to get this discussion going. Um, I'm uh, so I have to say, so the, for the benefit of those listening online or who, who didn't hear, that was simply a, a, a very emotional and uh, sincere and heartfelt plea to reconsider the concept of diagnosis in HD. I, I'm completely on board, and personally, when I speak to patients, I'm completely honest, and I say, I cannot officially diagnose you with HD because you don't have the physical symptoms, but I suspect that these symptoms and these that you're experiencing may well be due to HD, and I will write that in my letter to your GP, and I think that, that's the, that we will see progress in that direction. Thanks, Jeff and Ed. Um, I just want to say that you can get a diagnosis based on cognitive symptoms. You call it a mild cognitive impairment or a moderate cognitive impairment. So if you need to get a diagnosis that can help families, there are diagnoses out there. So you, you get the, if it's cognitive, 
you get a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or moderate cognitive impairment, and there's a coding for secondary to Huntington's disease. You can put it down or not, depending on how confidential you want to maintain. But therefore, both the ICD and the DSM acknowledges a diagnosis being given just for cognitive symptoms only. Thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, One more. Gentlemen, recently a, uh, a, a new drug uh, was given a lot of media fanfare, uh, nitromemantine for the treatment of Alzheimer's, and it was touted as uh, stemming, if not actually reducing uh, or reversing uh, the Alzheimer's. And I was wondering if you'd care to comment on that. It's a combination drug, nitromemantine. So memantine. This, yeah, memantine is the drug that Dr. Hayden mentioned today, which is the blocker of the overexcitation. And, and this, there's a new version, which is essentially a way of, of targeting it better and making it better at what it's doing. Uh, and, and so if the data that Dr. Hayden presented uh, is, is borne out in human studies with memantine, then that would be a, a great place to follow that up. Uh, going back to the question from the man who, about not having, uh, you know, symptoms in Korea, we're right in the middle of a fight with, you know, trying to get Social Security to take Korea off the end of the diagnosis. And if the doctors won't even recognize, you know, that patients can be sick without Korea, you know, we've got to have them behind us too. I completely agree about that. I have to say that there is a new generation of doctors who is perhaps more open-minded about this and will make diagnoses such as prodromal Huntington's disease or perimanifest Huntington's disease. And I think we are moving in the right direction, but like everything, change in the scientific community is painfully slow, and I apologize for that. I know, but we're asking Congress to change right now and let us get on that, you know, where we can get disability easier. Because yeah. there are people, you know, yeah, I have four in my difference. family and one of them shows no career. Yeah. So. Oh, one more. Do one more question? Okay. You guys aren't hungry, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is this on? Okay, yeah. hi. I just want to say I'm a big fan. I love HD Buzz. Um, you guys put things in layman's terms and it's really easy to read and understand. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. Um, my question is uh, do you know? Do you guys have any plans for any trials for juvenile Huntington's disease? Are there any trials planned for juvenile Huntington's disease? I know, it, I know disease? it's tricky because they're under the age of 18, many of them, and they're not eligible, eligible to participate in the adult trials. Um, so I was wondering if you guys maybe had anything in the works uh, specifically for them. Um, I personally, in our research group, we don't have anything tr uh, planned for juvenile Huntington's disease at the moment, but there was talk a while ago of a trial, um, now I forget the agent, I'm sorry, I, I don't know of any trials that are currently planned, but I do know that there is interest in running trials in juvenile Huntington's disease. Apart from anything else, because it progresses rapidly, it, it should be a setting where if you have a drug that's safe, if, it's, if it works, it should be fairly easy to tell that the drug is working. But equally, drugs have side effects, and if we don't think that a drug has a really good chance of working, we, don't, we, you know, we have to balance that with the risk of exposing someone whose life may be short to additional side effects, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's another area where we, we feel your pain, I think, as a research community. Yeah. Well, and certainly juvenile HD patients can help with research by taking part in Enroll. Um, that's completely open to them. And understanding juvenile HD, uh, which, is, as you know, is somewhat different from conventional HD, but has also other things in common, is a really important uh, aim that Enroll HD is setting out to try and study. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ed and Jeff. And, and let's get another round of applause for all of our speakers today. I'm sure, I know Ed and Jeff will be around for the rest of the day, so if there are questions that you have, feel free to grab them and, and ask away. Uh, thank you very much.